in short, I, will, I would present you as, um, <laughs> after reading some of your texts and books, uh, this is the man that uh, goes from Muddy Waters to John Cage in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Proud, proudly so. Yes. Thank you very much, Bjorn. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, by way of thanking other people, I think I'm going to try to introduce this talk uh, by integrating it with some of the things that have already been brought up. Um, some things that I wasn't so aware of when I wrote the, the talk and put the presentation together, but now uh, they seem uh, useful and maybe productive. Um, so uh, Georgiana mentioned uh, the kind of interest in uh, having this uh, conference deal with institutions and with the, the way that institutions deal with sound. Um, so you'll hear in this talk a bit about um, institutional critique as a kind of uh, tradition within the art world and how sound might engage uh, with that tradition. Um, and then uh, I only learned this morning uh, that Andreas has a background in uh, anthropology. And there's a bit in this talk about uh, ethnography, a kind of branch of anthropology, um, and a particular concern in, in art history with, with how uh, artists in, uh, deal with, with other cultures. Uh, so perhaps there's a way to, to weave that in. And then, uh, Osa, I'm sorry for pronouncing your name badly, but uh, Osa, I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, I know you've written on site specificity, and there's a good deal of, um, and that your work is also often site specific. There's a good deal of interest in site specificity in this talk as well. So maybe that's a way of weaving together some of the, some of the concerns of the conference in general here. Uh, this is more of a straight academic talk than, than what Andreas has just offered. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me as I read some of this. In my 2009 book, In the Blink of an Ear, I argue against the ineffability to which sound and music have always felt a privileged entitlement. The term ineffable is derived from the Latin, effari, meaning utterance. To be ineffable is to be unutterable, unspeakable, beyond the reach of mere words. As this ineffability would have it, Music and sound escape from what Frederick Jameson has called the prison house of language. But if language is a kind of prison, this suggests that there is a freedom outside this prison, that if we were to bust out of the joint, we would discover a world unfettered by restriction, compromise, convention, or structure. This ineffable world would be uncorrupted, pure, uninvaded by the schismatic infection of language. So when sound and music stake a claim to ineffability, they also stake a claim to wholeness, either one that has somehow been preserved against the incursive pollution of the real world, or one that has been reconstructed after the fall, Eden-like. Ineffability is a kind of transcendence, a kind of mysticism. Its power comes from without, from a beyond to which we have no access and upon which we can exert no influence. If we acknowledge that sound's effects are gener generated imminently from within its traditions, expectations, conventions, and gadgets, by subjects, institutions, and history, then as producers and listeners, we must attend to the same inventory of concerns and conditions, tradition, expectation, convention, gadgets, subjectivity, and institutions. Of the various ways in which the sonic arts attach themselves to the transcendent, two in particular strike me as being so deeply entrenched that they have become much more than tendencies, they have become fundamental principles, articles of faith. I refer to these two tendencies as sound in itselfism and the transposition fantasy. The first, sound in itselfism, seeks to detach sounds from their socio-historic causes and contexts. This tendency, pioneered and prophesied by John Cage, finds value in the sensual qualities of sounds and sometimes in their formal arrangement, rather than in their relation to the inventory of worldly concerns that I've just mentioned. The second, the transposition fantasy, imagines that retransmitting phenomena from one sense modality, like vision, to another, sound, somehow completes our experience of the world. This claim, uh, the transposition fantasy, rings false on two accounts. 
First, the meaning of data relies on context. If you transpose the data to a new modality, it loses its context and therefore loses its meaning. And secondly, it's foolish to imagine that one's experience of the world could possibly be complete. Together, these two tendencies underwrite the supposed value of an alarming percentage of contemporary sonic art. These two attachments to the transcendent are symptoms of a false sonic consciousness. Each projects a vision of imaginary wholeness in which identity and meaning are self-evident, avoiding the unavoidable fact that identity and meaning are always endless processes, that nothing is self-evident. Identity and meaning are always a product of specific relations under specific circumstances at a particular place and time. So what I want to ask today is, what would it mean for a sound work to construct itself not as transcendent, not as whole, not as self-evident? And to try to answer this question, I'll do something that's probably stupid. I'll talk about a work that I've known now for less than one month, uh, a new project by the band Billy Bow, and uh, I was hoping that Mateen would be here by now, but he's not. Uh, he will be here this afternoon, I hope, uh, because we're going to talk about this a little bit further. Um, Mateen is one of the members of, of the band Billy Bow. Um, so if you Google Billy Bao, you may read of a Nigerian expatriate who left his native Lagos for Bilbao. You may learn that after a period as a street musician, this Lagosian assumed the nom de guerre, Billy Bao, and joined up with Basque musicians Mateen and Xavier Erkezia to form a band that would share his name. Since 2005, the band Billy Bao has released a slew of recordings that combined the visceral politics of punk and the density of noise with a post-production cut-and-paste aesthetic. A couple of years ago, the band began making plans for Billy Bao to return to Lagos, to reconnect with the city and to make a new music uh, with Nigerian musicians. Last summer, uh, Mateen and Erkezia published their account of their time in Lagos in the Wire magazine's Global Ear column, and this is a page from that uh, issue of the magazine. Uh, the resulting recordings, the recordings that they made while there, uh, have not been released yet. The band refers to them as the Lagos Sessions, four tracks, each about 15 minutes in length, each envisioned as one side of an hour-long double LP. And this music is a departure, to some degree, from their previous work. Within the first minute of side A, we hear bursts of electronic noise, the sounds of, of street traffic, snippets of auto-tuned neja, the that dominates contemporary Nigerian pop, solo drumming and a cappella singing. Around the two-minute mark, a man sounding like the first rallying voice at a political protest chants, here in Lagos, the future is ours. He is followed shortly thereafter by a distorted guitar riff that sounds like a not-quite copy of the Stooges song, 1970. And it is not the quick-cut collage work that separates this from previous Billy Bow material, but the intense, saturated appropriation of a set of cultural signifiers, street sounds, political discourse, news broadcasts, and a variety of Lagosian music, popular and traditional, taken from recorded sources, captured in the streets, or recorded in a studio specifically for this project. With this, or against it, Billy Bow sets sections of performed noise punk. But they also manipulate recordings of the Lagosian music, layering, editing, and affecting it to create new textures and structures. At times, relatively long passages that could pass for songs are allowed to play. Side B, for instance, begins with four minutes of a Stooges-style rave-up, complete with overdriven vocals in English. The chorus repeats, we come from Lagos. Eventually, the song is swallowed by electronic noise, which then seeds to almost three uninterrupted minutes of a Nigerian man describing the ethnic, religious, political diversity that feeds the dissensus of Nigerian national politics. Later, against a dissonant soundscape, a woman sings an R&B melody without rhythmic or harmonic support about infrastructural problems in Nigerian commerce, transportation, health care, and utilities, all the while, quote, leaders still eating from the massive economic cake, unquote. I want to make a perverse claim about the Lagos Sessions. This project escapes sounds transcendent compulsions by being site-specific. And this claim may seem perverse on a few counts. Firstly, site-specificity is generally a visual arts term. 
There have been some attempts to theorize uh, the site specificity of sonic works, but most of this literature seems unaware of the vast and often revised thinking of site specificity in the visual arts. As a result, theories of sonic site specificity are not as sophisticated or nuanced. Secondly, site specificity most commonly refers to encountering the work in situ, in a particular location and set of circumstances that activate the work. The presumption is that if the work were reconstructed or reconvened in a different location under different circumstances, it would not function as well or possibly it would not function as all, just as Andreas has mentioned about the Bernard Leitner piece. Although site-specific works are almost always made on site, that is, in the same location in which they are eventually experienced by the audience, the term site-specific is usually more concerned with the spectatorial experience of the work in and as its site. Site-specificity is not usually overly concerned with the relationship of the making of the work to its site. So one approach that I could take would be for me to reorient the attention of site specificity toward the site of production rather than reception. This would allow me to talk about Lagos as the site of Billy Bao's intervention, but this will not be my approach. I will stubbornly, yet with purpose, retain, retain site specificity's attention to reception. I have encountered the Lagos session solely as an audio recording. I know that Billy Bao cannot control where, when, or under what circumstances you or I listen to these recordings, which makes the site of encounter unstable and unpredictable. So in order to engage the Lagos session specificity to its site, I will need to clarify what I mean by site. Miwan Kwan has offered what is probably the most influential genealogy of site specificity. In her book, One Place After Another, Site-Specific Art and Locational Identity from 2002, Kwan establishes three paradigms of site specificity which emerge in art history in roughly chronological order. The first, what she calls the phenomenological, responds to the physical realities of the space in which the work is encountered. The second paradigm, the institutional, goes beyond the parameters of the space itself to consider the agency and history of the gallery or museum. The third and most recent, discursive site specificity, goes beyond the parameters of the institution, taking site as a product of various intersecting narratives, debates, and practices. These intersections frame and work in a series of overlapping discursive matrices, generated intentionally and coincidentally by the artist, curators, critics, historians, patrons, spectators, commerce, and current events. Lytle Shaw, uh, who's an English professor at NYU, um, in his 2012 book, Fieldworks, From Place to Site in Postwar Poetics, highlights and modifies important implications of Kwan's account of site specificity. Shaw insists on recognizing that the, discurs the discursivity that a work claims as its site can complicate the relations generated by the work. A discursive site does not simply reveal a locational site, nor is it merely an, an environment within which the work exists. Instead, discursivity makes and masks what the work is and what the site is. Relying on obs observations made by the artist Robert Smithson, Shaw notes that despite various often and, uh, sorry, let me start again. Despite various and often insightful engagements with theory, critics of site-specific art have persistently avoided the problem of rhetorical mediation the ways that, as Smithson says, language covers rather than discovers its sites and situations. Thus, all three of Kwan's categories fold into each other in complicated and complicating ways. Even at the level of the discursive, we are no longer dealing simply with a linguistic text, but always with the context or the with text. The site is always constituted by overlapping matrices of reference, what Roland Barthes so famously called a fabric of citations. In order to account for the discursive site specificity of Billy Bao, in order to hear the discursive site specificity of the Lego sessions, we need to reattach music to its often implicit, often ignored, but always present socio-historic conditions of existence. So not only do I need to make a case for a revi revisionist view of discursivity and site specificity, 
but I also need to devise and demonstrate an alternate model of listening. This model locates the sonic work in the dispersed site of what is sometimes called the extra musical. That is, additional forces, influences, and relationships that license the motivations, structures, and meanings of the composition. These considerations extend listening to include the inventory of concerns and conditions I mentioned earlier, tradition, expectations, convention, gadgets, subjectivity, institutions, and history. So, acting on what was at first a flippant impulse, but now seems increasingly meaningful, I will call this model shallow listening, in contradistinction to Pauline Oliveros' notion of deep listening. So imagine the same volume of listening attention, but instead of condensing it within a concentrated, narrow-gauge bandwidth, shallow listening uh, allows it to pool at the surface, spreading out to encompass adjacent concerns and influences that the tunnel vision of the deep model would exclude. Billy Bow's The Lego Sessions necessitates shallow listening. In fact, other models of listening, whether deep or conventionally aligned with certain genres, are doomed to, to mishear the work. Deep listening suggests something to be quarried, something at the bottom, a bedrock, an ore, a materiality that contains riches. Oliveros, working along Cajun lines, imagines that sounds in themselves are deeply valuable entities imbued with eternally rewarding, sensual, and experiential qualities. Shallow listening, on the other hand, posits no such material riches. Rejecting sound in itself as an outright impossibility, shallow listening would also reject the transcendent ineffability of sound. Shallow listening insists on imminence, Shallow listening insists that we retain the ability to intervene and to affect the sights at play in the sonic work. The discursivity that creates Lagos doesn't map to any one geographical site. It is not bounded by the city limits, by the psyche of any individual Lagosian, or by Lagosians in general. The discursive sites of Lagos are many, overlapping, never mutually exclusive. One site may have been generated at another. For example, Lagos's relation to its site as a center of the slave trade cannot have been generated entirely within the geographical site of Lagos, but is largely generated in Britain and America. Additionally, a site may have been generated locally, exported, modified, and re-imported as a new recombinant site. One might think of Nigerian music traveling to America, only to mutate and return to Lagos as James Brown's funk before becoming the site of Fela's Afrobeat. In shallow listening, there should be no confusion. What we are hearing is not the sound of Lagos in itself, but the sound of an intention to represent the fabric of citations that constitute Lagos. We would not be unjustified were we to, rec were we to create a contraction here, converting Barth's phrase fabric of citations into fabrications. This leaves us with the fabrications that constitute Lagos. But interestingly, in a nulling sound in itself, we end up creating a version of the transposition fantasy that we now have to deal with. Instead of occurring between two sense modalities, this fantasy of transposition occurs between two cultures. Hal Foster, in his 1996 book, The Return of the Real, sees this transposition occurring in late 20th century art practices turn toward ethnography. For Foster, the transposition of the artist as ethnographer has everything to do with site specificity. The artist inhabits the site of the other, usually the exploited worker or the post-colonial subject. And vis-a-vis -vis this inhabitation, the artist identifies with the economic and social conditions of the other. The fantasy of transposition is that somehow the artist can assume the moral high ground of the oppressed to absorb her wounds and degradation, thereby healing the other, while absolving himself of guilt. Foster says that this fantasy uh, is based on the assumption that the site of political transformation is the site of artistic transformation as well, and that political vanguards locate artistic vanguards and, in some cases, substitute for them. What's particularly worrying about this ethical version of the transposition fantasy is that it aspires to a particularly virulent variety of transcendence. When the artist or the artwork or the spectator 
identifies with the other, this identification is based on and located on a fictitious site, a site of fantasy projected by the artist, the artwork, or the spectator as a transcendent idealization of purity and innocence. This is the unattainable space of utopia. And as Foster points out, it is a utopia forced into the service of the artist, the artwork, and the audience. This site is always elsewhere, in the field of the other. This elsewhere, this outside, is the Archimedean point from which the dominant culture will be transformed, or at least subverted. The site of the other is used to indemnify, inoculate, and absolve the privileged site of those with an investment in the artistic encounter and of the culture that licenses it. So is this what Billy Bao is doing with the Lego sessions? I think this is one of the many fascinating problems raised by this project. In order to engage this problem, because solving it is certainly out of the question, we must start by marking out some of the operative positions and sites of the Lagos sessions. It seems plain enough that the cultural aesthetic other of the Lagos sessions is Lagos itself. And we must re remain on our guard about Foster's problematics of ethnographic transposition. What symbolic violence does the othering of Lagos do to Lagos as a site? And what benefit does it provide for Billy Bao, for the Lagos Sessions project, or for me as a receptive listener? My conclusions, which are hardly conclusive, depend on what Foster calls both framing and critical distance. After appearing to damn a lot of the art that he sees as taking ethnographic approaches, Foster concludes that, in fact, the true evils are, one, over-identification with, or two, disidentification from the other. These two positions do little more than shore themselves up as finalities, utopian in their isolation. But for Foster, there's a third way. While fraught with danger and incontrovertibly compromised, this is the only type of engagement with the other that keeps differences active. This third way frames one's own artistic or ethnographic project, maintaining as much transparency as possible regarding the project's positions and sites. So one must work to preserve the project's critical distance without becoming satisfied that one has successfully outrun the hounds. There are a lot of musical sites invoked over the full hour of the Lego sessions. I've mentioned some of these already but the fabric of citations that constitute Lagos as a musical site are explicit. There is a reason that Lagos figures so prominently in Billy Bao's biography, and there is a, a reason that this is the Lagos sessions and not the Bilbao sessions or the Madrid sessions or the Kinshasa sessions. Lagos occupies a special position in the musical imagination. It is the birthplace of Afrobeat, the melded composite of traditional Nigerian, Yoruban, Beninese, and other West African musics with American funk and Latin jazz. Fela Kuti lived in Lagos, including a seven-year stretch in the 1970s when he declared his home, the Calicuta Republic, an independent state within the city limits of Lagos. Fela is, of course, a very controversial figure, a great musical innovator, an intellectual who studied in London and gradually became politicized, turning his music and his celebrity into vehicles for resistance, first to the lingering effects of colonialism and later to internal Nigerian factionalism, corruption, and oppression under a succession of military regimes. On albums, <coughs> excuse me, on albums such as Mayo 8, Buildings from Bilbao, and Urban Disease, Billy Bao also uses music as a political tool, directing a sonic bile and scorn at global capitalism, the co-opting of various cultural forms, and the deactivation of modes of anti-conformist living. On Billy Bao's 2008 release, May 08, a lengthy section of Fela's celebrated and notorious song, Zombie, is woven into the mix. Mateen, one of the members of Billy Bao, is a prolific thinker and writer, having published widely on art, music, and politics. In 2009, he edited the volume Noise and Capitalism with Anthony Isles. So it's safe to assume that by situating the Lagos sessions so specifically in this particular named West African city, Billy Bao is also invoking the politics of site specificity as a site. The project functions as a site-specific work, but it also intervenes in the conversation that is site specificity. 
Among the discursive sites that are implicitly invoked and inhabited are the texts that I've cited here, most notably and most certainly Miwan Kwan's One Place After Another and Hal Foster's The Artist as Ethnographer. Foster's text invokes uh, Walter Benjamin's The Artist as Producer, while also borrowing and adapting some of Benjamin's political reasoning. Undoubtedly, as a politically engaged artist and thinker, Mateen is also aware of and engaged with Benjamin's text. It's less likely that Lytle Shaw's Fieldworks is intentionally engaged by Billy Bow. Shaw's is a much more recent uh, book, uh, just three years old. But nevertheless, I want to take up a point that Shaw makes, drawing together various discursive sites into productive friction. Shaw relates site specificity, especially the discursive variety, to institutional critique. Discursive site specificity is almost always involved in an archaeology of its sites, pitting texts against each other, teasing out internal contradictions, and in the best cases, excavating the work's own complicity in the relations being exposed and created. Shaw points out that most of the artists uh, that Quan discusses, including Mark Dion, Andrea Frazier, and Renee Green, have been closely associated over the last 20 years with the, Win the Whitney Independent Study Program, uh, which is a, a year-long uh, study program in New York. What Shaw doesn't mention is that Hal Foster served for a time as director of critical and curatorial studies at the Whitney ISP. In fact, Foster himself states that The Return of the Real, the book in which the artist as ethnographer appears, was conceived during his tenure there. So suddenly, the site of discursive site specificity and the site of the artist as ethnographer um, are revealed as overlapping. What's more, these two sites map to the site of institutional critique. The adjacency of institutional critique to site specificity encourages the two sites, the two discourses, to construct themselves similarly. The issues here, as Shaw observes, uh, the issue here, as, so, as Shaw observes, is that site specificity emphasizes the spatial rather than the temporal or the historical. Shaw's concern is not that the Whitney program is co-opting the discourse of institutional critique, but that the ISP's concomitant uh, dedication to site specificity and institutional critique forecloses other avenues of analysis. Focusing on the ways that museums, in effect, vaccinate themselves by inviting critical shufflings of their collections by artists. The ISP seems to have taught its artists and critics, including Quan, to think of the dynamic relation between critique and containment in spatial rather than temporal terms. Now, here's the kicker. Mateen also attended the Whitney Independent Study Program. So it's no stretch to say that the Whitney program becomes another key site of the Lagos sessions. Mateen's participation in the ISP puts him, so to speak, at the scene of the crime, the discursive site where institutional critique, the artist as ethnographer, and site specificity are transformed into, th into the three heads of a beastly Cerberus guarding the entrance to the art historical underworld. And I included this slide because my four-year-old daughter is obsessed with Cerberus at the moment, and uh, she wanted to make sure that I included Cerberus in my presentation. So I found a way to make it work. Um, I don't invoke uh, the Cerberus as a way of attacking Billy Bao or the Lagos sessions. Instead, I put this three-headed discursive site into play in order to allow us to think about the operative discursive sites of the Lagos sessions. One of the more problematic and potentially productive sites is the position staked out by the Lagos sessions relative to Foster's anxieties about the ethical defensiveness of such ethnographic projects. The other engages Shaw's critique as the now common institutional strategy of inviting imminent critique as a way of holding more vicious dogs at bay. So we need to listen shallowly to the Lagos sessions, allowing our listening attention to overflow the cavity of sound in itself. It would be silly to listen to the sounds of these recordings as discrete phenomena, disconnected from the world in which they were produced and in which we listen, untroubled by the phenomenological, institutional, and discursive sites with which they converse. But just as surely it would be folly to imagine that the Lagos Sessions delivers Lagos. The reason for this, as we have discussed, are twofold. First, there is no real Lagos, inviolate and true. Lagos is constituted by its discursive sites, 
overlapping and constantly shifting text tectonically with and against each other. Second, transposition is a fantasy. Shifting facts or phenomena from one medium or another, uh, sorry, from one medium or sense to another does not complete our understanding of the source material. We cannot reveal the truth of Lagos or the world because as Smithson says, that truth is just as much covered as it is discovered by language. The sites of the Lagos session only become meaningful when they are allowed to, to leak out of their pipes, to seep into the groundwater of adjacent sites. Meaning is spillage. Listening shallowly to the Lagos sessions, we must come to, to, to terms with the fact that there is no depth to what we are hearing. Sound is spillage. It spreads out ever thinner, like the Nile in August. We must listen shallowly to the Lagos sessions, ever aware of its relation to its discursive sites. Even to focus our listening on the site of Lagos, the city and its history is not enough. We must go shallower. Does the Lego session su successfully frame its ethnographic complicity? Can it maintain a critical distance even while making criticality so intrinsic to what it is? In other words, can it remain self-critical? What do its politics sound like? Can we speak of a sonic ethics? Or maybe, maybe, we can agree that it's time to recognize sound as merely a vehicle. Let's devote our enthusiasms and thoughts to the relationships the work engages and creates between its makers, its audience, and the world. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure.